And uh, so our boys all tried to ski. The problem up there is uh, that week that we were there, the water was pretty cold. I'm guessing not, it couldn't have been over 60 uh, degrees. And uh, our boys did not have wetsuits or dry suits or anything. So they all tried to ski, uh, you know, three, four times. And, and you know, they just give up. They're too cold. So the next year, Young Life asked me to speak again. And our 12-year-old son, David, said, Dad, can, can you buy a wetsuit for us? or a dry suit or something, and I said, David, no, we can't afford that right now, and uh, um, he says, well, could you borrow one from one of your friends? He knew that I skied with lots of guys who have wetsuits and dry suits, and I said, uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, why don't you pray that God will provide you with a wetsuit? Um, I don't remember if I really thought God was going to provide him one, but I thought it would be good for him, to his faith, uh, to, to trust in God. So every night, David would pray, God, would you provide uh, me with a, uh, a wetsuit uh, for, for up there in Malibu? Well, um, when we arrived, you, you go to Vancouver, and then you take an eight-hour boat ride uh, up to Malibu. And when we arrived, they showed us to our our, our cabin where we were staying and Jory got there ahead of me and uh, so she was just coming out the door as I was coming in she says check out the closet and in the closet was hanging a full-length brand new black and green wetsuit and uh, so uh, that very afternoon we went down to water ski and David said can I take the wetsuit I said I don't think so I don't know whose it is and I asked around the staff nobody knew anything about it and so we're down there waiting our turn, and I, I turn to Jory, and he says, it does sort of seem like God provided that. Uh, why don't we let him wear it? And so I told David to go back. So he came back 10 minutes later, all decked out in this wetsuit. He was so proud, and he got in the water and skied for the first time. You know what I think happened? I think God looked down and saw this 12-year-old boy praying every night for God to provide him a wetsuit, and God just thought, you know, how can I turn that down? Have you ever had an answer to prayer in your life where it was just obvious that God was helping you? Would you like to be able to pray like that and see big answers? Uh, I think you and I can learn a lot about prayer from the Old Testament character Joshua. Uh, if you want to follow along with me, we have Bibles under the seats. You have to kind of hunt around for them uh, uh, the, uh, the way we've set things up here today. By the way, people in the back, come on up. I see seats up here uh, that are, are they're open. Um, it's on page 221, uh, Joshua chapter 10. Now, if you're new, let me bring you up to speed. Uh, this is the eighth in a series of messages called Putting God's Power to Work in Your Life. We're looking at how we can practically use God's power in our lives today. And we're looking at the Old Testament character of Joshua. God led the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. And, uh, they came, and he promised them the land of Canaan as their inheritance. Moses died and he chose Joshua to lead the people in. He says, take the people across the Jordan River and I give you the land to conquer. And it, it's yours. And so uh, God first parted uh, the uh, Jordan River and... Uh, uh, so they walked across on dry ground. Then, um, um, so uh, then they had, uh, uh, they conquered the, the, the city of Jericho and I, two walled cities, strong, mighty cities. They created a wedge through the center of Canaan. Uh, the people learned that they could uh, uh, experience God's power only by uh, relying on him. They're totally dependent on God. Well, as they are in a battle for the south of Canaan, uh, Joshua realizes that uh, the sun is going to go down and they're not going to have time to defeat all these uh, Canaanites from these five cities in the south of Canaan. So he prays, uh, God, cause the sun to stand still. Um, we read, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Aijalon. Can you imagine the audacity of asking God to, to do that? Cause the sun to stand still? But even more amazing than that is the next verse. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped. God answered Joshua's prayer. 
Uh, would you like to experience dramatic answers to prayer like that in your life? Uh, then let's look, look with me at Joshua's prayer and what makes it so effective. You can pray audacious prayers and see them answered. So this is Joshua chapter 10. Now Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its kings as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than I, and all its men were good fighters. So Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon, come up and help me attack Gibeon, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites joined forces, they moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The, Gibeons then, the Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us, because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces together. Now let's put this together. The Gibeonites are terrified of the Israelites. Uh, the Israelites have come across miraculously uh, through the Jordan River. They've defeated uh, Jericho and I. And so they don't want to be destroyed. And so they make, uh, they, they set up a ruse. They come and, and, and act like they are travelers from far, far away. They have old wineskins, a moldy, uh, hard bread. And they say, make a treaty for us. We've heard about you from a distant country. And so, without consulting God, Joshua and the Israelites make a treaty with them. Well, then the king of Jerusalem hears about this, and Gibeon is one of the mightiest cities, uh, royal cities in Canaan. And so he's alarmed. So he contacts the four uh, kings of other cities around him and says, let's join forces and attack Gibeon. They want to show Gibeon, this is what happens to anybody who betrays us and uh, makes a treaty with Israel. So the Gibeonites, Gibeonites cry out to Israel for help. They say, you, may, you signed a treaty with us. It's time now to fulfill it. Come save us or we're going to be destroyed. They probably hold their breath, waiting to see if Israel will actually come. Joshua realizes that he has made a treaty with them. And uh, Joshua's integrity continues to shine. If he'd been a lesser man, he might have seen this as a way to escape the treaty he'd been tricked into signing. And he said, well, I'll just sit back and watch the other kings, uh, five kings obliterate Gibeon and my problem solved. Uh, they're getting what they, they deserve. They tricked me into signing anyway. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army including all the best fighting men, the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. Now remember, when you see the, Israel, uh, the Canaanites being driven out, your reaction might be, Wow, God drove out all those people, killed so many of them. Isn't that unfair of God? Remember now, the Canaanites knew about God from Abraham. Abraham lived in Canaan. Uh, but they chose not to believe in God and not to follow him. Instead, they adopted wicked practices of witchcraft, child sacrifice, and they used male and female prostitutes in their uh, uh, religious worship. So don't try to make some case that God is unfair and unmerciful. He gave them 500 years. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Beth Haron, and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Machedah. Though the Israelites do not consult God before signing this treaty, God works it out for good. God says to, uh, to Joshua, I'm using this to cause many of the Canaanite kings to join together to fight against you, and I'm giving them all into your hand. So upon assurance that God is going to do that, 
Joshua marches his, his army, his best fighting men, 25 miles from Gilgal to Gibeon, and they come upon uh, the Canaanites in a surprise attack early in the morning. The five kings never stood a chance. Now here God intervenes with two acts of nature. First, hailstones fall upon the enemy. As they fled before Israel, verse 11, on the road down from Beth Haron to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. A large hailstones fall in a divine carpet bombing. There's no other way to describe this than as a miracle, because the hailstones fell on the Canaanites and not on the Israelites. Second, God prolongs the day. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O son, stand still. At this point, as Joshua watches the fleeing armies, it dawns on him that this is an unprecedented opportunity to destroy all the, the, the Canaanites in the south in one battle, uh, rather than having to fight five different battles with them all back in their walled cities who would be far more difficult. At the same time, a second thought comes to him. The sun is going to set before we're going to have a chance to drive them all out and destroy them. And so he cries out this audacious prayer. And then we read, so the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Joshua, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. Now, we can't use the phrase, the sun stopped in the sky, to prove that the Israelites were ignorant cosmologically. We never hear anybody uh, today say when the sun comes up in the morning, the earth turned enough so that we could see the sun. If you say the sun is rising and someone responds to you, how ignorant you are. Uh, what's really happening is the earth is tilting so you can see the sun. I mean, you'd laugh at somebody that says that to you because that's not the way we talk. There are several ways to interpret the sun stopped in the middle of the sky. They usually have to do with how we view miracles. When I was a freshman in college, back in the days of Abraham Lincoln, um, the, uh, I was assigned a roommate from California. And we just didn't hit it off right from the start. Uh, we had, uh, I, I wear contacts, and uh, so uh, we have two beds, two mirrors, and cabinets and so I set up a nice clean towel on mine so I could put my contacts on in the morning in a nice you know clean spot and my roommate had a beard like you Chuck and he would cut his beard in front of my mirror so I'd show up to do my contacts and there's all this hair and I say what's going on man why do you have to do that and he kept doing it he also smoked and we'd turn the light off at night and then he would light up and I'd lay over there thinking, I'm going to die of secondhand smoke. This is terrible. I talked to him about that, but he didn't change. And then he laughed at me for my belief that Jesus was the Son of God and that Jesus did miracles. He thought it was so ludicrous that someone could believe in miracles. Maybe you're like my roommate, and you don't believe uh, in miracles. Some say the story of the sun stopping is a myth. The event described never took place. It's just the account of overzealous, imaginative Hebrew writers. Others suggest that the passage is to be taken poetically. In this case, you don't have to explain the miracle. There isn't one. The account of the battle is nothing more than poetic imagery that should not be taken literally. We're to understand these verses to mean it seemed like the sun stood still because the battle went on so long. But this view hardly explains the author that says there has never been a day like it before or since. The interpretation, I believe, is that God lengthened the day by prolonging the light. How God did this, I don't know. Did he slow the earth's rotation? Uh, did he tilt the earth on its axis? thus causing the sun to remain above the, the horizon like happens in Alaska in the, in the summer? In both these cases, the miracle would have been experienced worldwide. 
Well, that's interesting because it turns out that Egyptian, Aztec, Chinese, and Hindu historical records all report a mysteriously long day that would have, been, that would have happened in Joshua's time. Professor Pickering at the Harvard Observatory says in his research about the Big Bang Theory that since the dawn of creation, he finds one full day missing. A day he traces to the time of Joshua. Somehow, God extended the day so the Israelites could finish the battle. The account ends with these words. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Never has there been a day when God listened so intently to the prayer of one person. Joshua made an audacious request of God, and God answered. Might he do something similar for you? Yes, you can pray audacious prayers and see them answered. Why does God listen to Joshua's prayer? What makes Joshua's prayer so effective? How can we pray audacious prayers and see them answered? I find four ways. First, put full faith in the reliability of God's word. God says to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Joshua believes God. So when he says, sees the day drawing to a close and that they are nowhere near chasing down all the Canaanites, he asks God to extend the day. Trusting God's promise of victory in your impossible situation and acting on that promise may be difficult, especially if the opposition you face is for as formidable as that of the Canaanite armies. But maybe you can see through Joshua's example that you too can put your faith in Christ in the midst of your situation. Are you on the brink of faith like Joshua? Put your trust in Christ's new inheritance power that is embedded within you if you've put your trust in Christ. That power is the same power which God used when he raised Christ from the dead. Second, make bold, audacious requests of God. I'm impressed with the boldness of Joshua's request. Cause the sun to stand still, God. Give us more time to finish the job you've asked us to do. We worship a big God. A big God can handle big requests. Do you make audacious requests of God appropriate for how big he is? Or are your prayers too small? John Newton writes, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. Max Lucado in his book Glory Days tells about Greg Pruitt. Greg Pruitt is an engineer, a linguist, and a Bible translator. Uh, but he's probably best known for his extreme prayer. In his book, Extreme Prayer, he tells about being called back to the States uh, to uh, be president of uh, Pioneer Bible Translators. And this was in 2008 when the recession hit. And he watched the finances of their organization go like this. And he didn't know what to do. He hadn't been trained for, for this kind of assignment. You know, donors were going away. The, the recession was just sucking money out of the economy. And so he did the only thing he could think of, prayer. He sent out a half-page email to all his team worldwide. And he says, we have to pray. Otherwise, our organization is going down the tube. Make bold requests of God to provide. And when we got to the end of the year, he cried. Because it was so obvious that God had answered his prayer. He said, if an analyst had been looking over my shoulder, the analyst would have pointed at the month of July. That's when he sent out the, the email to his team. Whatever you did then, keep doing it. That's when he was in a situation when he said, I don't have any other hope but God. I have here only God and prayer. Maybe that's the kind of situation you're in. You're in a situation where you say, I don't know what to do, God. All I've got is you in prayer. 
Like Joshua, you face battles. Five kings are bearing against you. Discouragement, deception, defeat, destruction, death. They roar into your world like a hell's angel motorcycle gang. Their goal is to chase you back into the wilderness. Don't give an inch. Respond in prayer. Bold, audacious prayer. If you've committed your life to Christ, you have received a new inheritance. The essence of Christ has been embedded in you. You've been embedded with his resurrection power. Confidently make your request of him, not because of what you've done, because of what Christ has done. Third, dare to go public with your requests. Joshua prays, the text says, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. God, Joshua doesn't just make his request privately in his bedroom. He asks in front of all Israel. You know what that means? If God doesn't answer his prayer, he's going to have egg on his face. Everybody's going to see that he made this request and it wasn't answered. Time and again, Jesus goes public with his requests. Remember when he raised Lazarus from the dead? He comes and he says in front of all the people, God, I ask this so that all of you might believe in me, so that all the people might believe in me. And then he says, Lazarus, come out. What if Lazarus didn't budge? It would call into question his claim to be the Son of God. The day you learn to be publicly specific with your request is the day you will discover power in prayer. To be publicly specific in the hearing of others is to risk the embarrassment that your prayer will not be answered. Most of you know we have nine kids. In a family with nine kids, we have a lot of mini crises that have taken place over the years where somebody can't find something. And so I would do what I call a code blue. Every, all hands on deck helping find this. I'm convinced you have uh, uh, the number of little crises of losing something uh, is directly proportional to how many people you have living in your household. I mean, there's just a lot more hands touching things. Now, the good news in a big family is when it's time to clean up, there's a lot more people to help. The bad news is people have different ideas where to put things. One time, Jory lost her keys to the, her kid's spire office, and uh, we called a code blue, and everybody looked, but we never found them. A month later, we found her keys in Andrea's kitchen set. A lot of our kids have had papers come home from school that they needed and they were gone because somebody threw them in the, probably me, somebody threw them in the recycle or worse yet, the garbage. A lot of kids, came, you know, have come home with papers to be signed and I, I think it, you know, and I throw it out so they have to fish through recycle or worse yet, the garbage and have chicken smell or t tuna fish smell on their paper as they take it back. One time, one of our sons, uh, Joel, had a, uh, a, a, a paper due the next day, and he needed a book that he had checked out from the library, but he couldn't find it. He looked everywhere, and he was going crazy. I said, hold on. I gathered the family around, and we prayed that he could find his book. He found it within one minute. But we took the risk of praying in front of our whole family. What if God didn't answer? You want to see power in prayer? Learn to pray in front of others, your family, your co-workers, or fellow Christians. And uh, God likes when we take a risk of faith in Him in front of others. Fourth, pray for things that are in God's will. God tells Joshua not to be afraid of this uh, confederacy of five uh, Canaanite armies. He's going to give them to <coughs> give him victory. Knowing that God has chosen him to be the instrument of punishment on the Canaanites for all their sins for over 500 years, uh, Joshua asked God to extend the day so he can drive all these Canaanites out. He asked for something that's in God's will. Praying for something in God's will is essential 
to power in prayer. The Apostle John says, read this with me. This is one of the most famous uh, verses from 1 John. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. The problem with many of us is that we don't ask things that are in God's will. In other words, they're not best for us. You can pray audacious prayers and see them answered. Empty nester, married person, single person, parent, teenager. God is willing to go to almost any length to meet your need. So let's try some things this week. Let's come to God in prayer in faith. Let's make bold requests. Let's be publicly specific with our requests. And let's pray in God's name or in God's will. And bring extra sunscreen because the victory God gives may extend the day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this account from Joshua. Amazing request. Cause the sun to stand still. And even more amazing, you answered it. Lord, we want to experience that kind of dramatic answers to prayer in our lives. I want to give you a moment. Hope you have your heads all bowed. Would you like to experience what Joshua experienced? Asking big things, seeing big answers, uh, bigger faith, bigger requests, bigger answers. Would you tell God that right now? If you've never given your life to Christ, this would be a great time to do it. Say, Jesus, I do believe you're the Son of God. And would you forgive my sins and come into my life and embed within me your resurrection power? You pray. Thank you, Lord God, that you want to have a relationship with us. And one of the ways we can experience a relationship with you is through prayer. And we pray that we would ask bigger requests, more appropriate for what a huge God you are. And we'd be come in faith and we'd pray for things in your will. And we'd be willing to be public about our requests in front of others. Take a risk. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.